Clantricent, built as a fortress town to keep a stony, commanding eye on the Vale of Glamorgan. If Glamorgan needed a capital, this could be it. From the beginning of time, it has been a center of military turbulence. From here, the embattled hill folk probably told the trampling Normans to stay home and stop being a nuisance. The slopes are sharp and punishing. Ancient warriors attacking this citadel never had enough breath left to explain where they had come from. This confused historians. It is an enclosed, mysterious place. Still living a life very much of its own, quite distinct from the mining valleys to the north and the farmlands to the south. Once there were so many pubs here, the church had a cork spire. Here, in the memory of these men, the miners of the Rhondda came to Royster. They arrived by trap and left by float. Time is ripe and mellow here. The old men relish and sip it as if it were air. A cautious place, the name suggests. Clantricent, the church with three saints. Most churches make do with one, but here the sinners had a triple indemnity. They still call the men of Clantricent the Black Prince's men. This is the Black Prince's tower, the mouldering finger of what was once a pretty mighty fist. The bees are the only inheritors, the only echo of the fury that once buzzed here. I think bees are just right here. The whole place is a honeycomb of time, ivy and silence. And it is nice to think of bees and chickens taking over from the pomp and terror that once encamped here. And in the shadow of any fragment of past greatness, children will always play. The news of the day laps the residue of centuries. Is the Black Prince a ghostly presence or the latest thing to take off from Cape Canaveral? Flantricent now is rarely in the news. Only some stubborn rearguard action by the citizens to safeguard their common land against housing or open cast mining. The last great scandalous excitement was the case of Dr. William Price, pioneer of cremation in a zone dedicated to fuel. When he erected his first pyre, he was nearly lynched by the townsfolk who insisted that he should play it cool. He was a rabid eccentric who kept whippets of the area on edge by wearing a rabbit skin hat with a tail hanging down the back. This is the road that slopes northwards to Coidili and the Ronda. The first of the great tips. Rather like the pyramids of Egypt, but we could not persuade our pharaohs to be built into them. The road out of Tonrevel, one of the few towns one leaves by vertical takeoff. So many cars stall on this hill, many people here still think that Ford backed a loser. The wine bare, beautiful moorland that leads to the Toothed Ridge, which is the Ronda's southern border. Up to these heights come the old men to talk and the lovers to lie and watch the old communion of the wind and the sky. Scattered here and there are tiny communities dropped as casually as a curse on some old mining project. This is home territory, the long descent from Trebanag to Porth. Before one, the earth splits in three. Here, over the last hundred years, we have seen one of the world's greatest explosions of music, work and thought. Every note of laughter and tears has been struck between these hills every variation on the theme of farce, courage and nobility. Running up and down these slopes as a child gave one knee bone so bowed and bandy one could be rolled like a hoop. In the chapels of these villages I sang so loud and long I was badgering the county council for a second-hand larynx before I was ten. In 
In these streets and lanes, we played the epic games of childhood. Cops and robbers, strikes and lockouts, last man in, weak horses, strong donkeys, and incidentally, ruined the nervous system of shift workers who were trying to get a wink of sleep. Porth Square, this was the hub of our world. From all the hillside streets, we flooded down to shop, to gossip, to catch the latest news in the astonishing pageant of comedy and calamity which made up the life of the valley in those days. Like all squares in all towns, this was a kind of university. One learned one's first scraps of confidence in the strange campaign of boy and girl affection. One listened to the old men talk of ancient wars and distant places. One assembled here for the annual exodus to the sea with the Sunday school of one's choice. One strutted here in one's Easter Sunday best, tried to make a minute impression on the immeasurable world. It is a small square infested by large buses. They wheel eternally around the town's central convenience. It is a kind of Welsh roulette. If the rates could have stood it, they could have had a convenience that went round with the buses. The river Rhondda, a rocky and petulant stream, now losing the jet blackness it had when I was a boy. We bathed in it and changed colour so fast we didn't need any protective costume. If we were caught, we had the choice of being summoned or processed as patent fuel briquettes. Now life has sprouted from places that we knew as small wildernesses. New industries along the river's left bank have arisen to counterbalance the vast cemetery that dominates the right bank. Coal has lost its dominance. Once, the mining activity was so passionate, a man on his way out of the house would pause and wonder whether he would sink a pint or a pitch shaft. So much digging, even the moles carried union cards in self-defense. Now, there are men who can only try, in their memories, to make sense out of 40, 50 years of tearing out the geological substrata of the Ronda to provide a score of peerages for the stockbrokers of Cardiff and quite a tidy few funerals in the gulch itself. Tonopandi Square. Walk around here, talk and listen, and you will still hear the echoes of the rebellious years, the time, tolerance and tombola have diluted the black rage that reached its peak in the riots of 1910. Now the storm is gone. The old conflicts as quiet as the statues of their protagonists. A new tranquility and a new joy are trying to assert themselves on the excessive piety and sullen uncertainties of the past. The roads that link the valleys, like the one over Penrice Ridge, and a whole more frivolous and smiling philosophy have made existence a more sprightly thing altogether. These are the roaming Bedouins of the valley, the National Army of Liberation, who never wanted us here in the first place and are now waiting for us to go on. They have the vaulting power of Spring-Heeled Jack, will strip a garden bare in less time than it takes to say mutton and will leave a note telling you what kind of vegetables you should try to improve. They have ways of wearing wool that would fox Norman Hartnell. They hate perpendicular ash bins, will hit them flat systematically during their night prowl and will even come back to check on whether they have missed any. The Rhondda employs a borough shepherd who has the doomed task of trying to corral either the sheep or the hillside farmers who let them stray. Fortunately, sheep are docile, unimaginative and without malice, and they have not yet been admitted into the bingo schools. The end of the Big Valley, and in its bare finality, could be the world's end. over the ridge into the little Rhondda. This is Jimmy Wild country. If you didn't have superb footwork, you just went flat on your face. The streets buck like broncos. The housing pattern is so fantastically confused, even pigeons returning from races have been seen poised in a long hover, 
comparing notes and asking how anyone can really be sure. Here once was a pit, a very productive and wealthy pit. It witnessed one of the longest and most bitter fights between management and men. The fists were never unclenched. No one gave in, no one's pride gave way, only the pit died. And the labor of years molded and frittered away to this. Less than a mile away from the old Mardi pit, the new Mardi Buster prospect, linking the Rhondda and the Aberdare valleys, speaks up for a tidier future, where we shall have forgotten what caused these holes strung along the hillside like the footprints of a heavily built yeti.